much, for Gil, for this fascinating talk. Um, I'd like to introduce to the stage the next speaker, Mr. Bob Kalka, Vice President of IBM. Morning, everybody. Good to see you. It's so good to be back here again at Cyber Week. Uh, I am the Global Vice President of Cybersecurity for IBM. I realized at the awesome Team 8 reception last night that uh, this is actually a year of personal milestones for me to be here. Uh, number one is yesterday I realized was my 29th anniversary with IBM, which, wow, thank you for the IBM fans. <laughs> Um, of which the last 24 of those years has been working on acquiring 28 cybersecurity companies that has built us into the, one of the three largest cybersecurity companies in the globe now. And so it's been a huge area of passion for literally over two decades for me, and this is one of the highlight events for us every year. But far more importantly, uh, I also realized last night that two weeks from today will be my 25th wedding anniversary. And my wife, Kelly, is actually with us here today. And so I'd ask you to uh, welcome her and give her a warm welcome to Israel. And uh, say hi to her on the breaks, but I would just beg of you, if you do meet her and when you see how beautiful she is, please suppress the thought because you're going to have this thought of how did that guy end up with her, okay, so thank you. Anyways, I digress just slightly. Um, so let's talk about where we go next with this stuff because this is a huge topic. Uh, I think Rick and Gil really did a great job of getting into this, but what I wanna share with you is the biggest problem that we're having is that with the shelf life of so many of the innovations taking place being so small, if you think about it, every year, if you go to a cyber conference, right, inevitably there's a theme of the year, right? Five years ago, it was DLP, right? This year, you could make an argument that it's orchestration. Last year, it was shared threat intelligence, right? We have a different theme every year, and we keep building on these things. There's nothing wrong with these things, but there's always the next thing that's going to solve the problem. And it occurred to me what makes the challenge for a lot of these innovations goes back to what is innovation in the first place. It's one of those words we use loosely like, hey, it's new and cool, so that's innovative. The best definition for innovation I have ever heard before is from a guy who probably had the most unique career path of every, any CISO in this room. This guy, his name is Kirk Kness. He uh, is at T. Rowe Price in Baltimore, Maryland. And Kirk was the CISO for several years and then got promoted to chief innovation officer for the company from the CISO slot. I don't know if I've ever seen that. It's probably a random sample of one. And the reason that they promote him, because he was incredibly creative as the CISO and very effective, and he gave me a definition 15 years ago of innovation that stuck with me for the entire time. He said, Bob, innovation is just simply connecting the obvious in a way that others haven't seen yet. That's what innovation is. Someone sees a path to connect stuff together that the rest of us haven't seen yet. And then when you see it and you get there, you go, oh, that's brilliant, dude, right? So the thing is, is we have these innovations happening and yet, which are the ones that stick? Which are the ones that really go with us? So let's get into this a little bit. So here's what our problem is. We have all these innovations taking place but we have human beings trying to ingest and do something with them, right? And the biggest problem I'd assert to you we have in cyber right now as all this innovation, innovative stuff is happening is distraction. Now let's talk about distraction for a minute. Let me give you a tragic case first. Many of you are probably familiar with the case of the USS Fitzgerald, an American ship which uh, cr had uh, ran into a Philippine-based merchant vessel going at slow speed in the, in the very populated waters off of the coast of Japan. It was a tragic case. Seven people lost their lives all on the American ship, 
and it's caused an estimate $500 million of damage to that ship. I don't know if anyone here has read the report that the U.S. government released on this crash, but guess what the two core reasons for that, think about it, a U.S. warship with all the radar, all the equipment, all the analytics it has on it, running into another ship, that's crazy. So guess what the two root causes were? Number one, the radar wasn't tuned right. It was set to long-range open seas, not short-term busy ship traffic. So the tool was configured incorrectly. And the second thing is they discovered that there was a trust issue between the group on the bridge and the group down below. What happens in any relationship when you don't trust the other person? You stop communicating. So you have a powerful warship where the tool is tuned in correctly and the people aren't communicating. This sounds like a lot of the security analytics SIM tools that we see in people around the world today. I know it's a weird analogy, but we have poorly tuned tools and people not communicating well. That's a root cause there. Well, the bigger problem for us in cybersecurity right now is this. The whole reason we exist in cybersecurity is to do risk management. That's why when someone has the audacity to say, oh, you know, there's no such thing as 100% security, right? Well, there's not, because it's risk management. That's what we're supposed to be doing. The reason why all of us put in these tools, I have one client that is paying maintenance right now on 288 security tools from 65 vendors. How do you do risk management without much tooling? You know how you get there? It's because people, most of the security programs in the world we've seen are really built for compliance, not for risk management. And by, I like to say playfully with CISOs. Because uh, by the way, I just hit 9.5 million air miles with American Airlines, doing nothing but meeting, I know it's worth a laugh. Um, doing nothing, it's probably why I'm still married happily after 25 years. <laughs> I've been on the road a lot. Um, but what happens is the vast majority of the shops we walk into, I like to say, you have a choice as a CISO. You can do risk management or you can do career management. <laughs> because when you're checking the boxes for compliance, you're going to get through the next audit. But are the tools actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? The world is full of underdeployed security tools right now, and we have all these great innovations taking place, and what are we doing them, right? So let's talk about what we do with distractions to help make this happen. AI can eliminate distraction. Maybe. Depends on how you use it, right? It all comes down to how do we actually use this stuff. We have found that, uh, here you go, quick statistics. Our researchers have found there's an average of 7,426 new pages of threat intelligence generated daily. 7,426 new pages of threat intelligence generated daily. The average user, the average human being reads 150 words a minute. There's no way to keep up with what's coming out today, let alone trying to combine that with the last two to three decades of threat intelligence that's out there. Add to that the fact that the most common practice human beings use to search that threat intelligence is a radical technique called Google search. And only 20% of the world's threat intelligence is indexed and searchable. So literally, the most common practice today is to manually search through 20% of the data to try to do threat intelligence. That's insane. That's why, and so what we learned is there's three fundamental problems, and everybody knows the first one. Everybody says, oh my gosh, it takes a while to do searches and find the right links to figure out if in fact that this configuration changed to this device and some strange network behavior right after that, if anyone else has seen it out there, right? So everybody knows it takes a while to do that, but guess what? We found two other critical problems here, and this is why we need AI here. The second thing is accuracy. We did a study of a bunch of um, level one SAC analysts and said, how do you do threat intelligence? They said, we do search and then we scan the documents really fast. Guess what? When a level one SOC analyst is skimming a document and reads a sentence that leads them to believe they don't have a match for the case they're looking for, what do they do? They move on to the next document. Not realizing that three paragraphs later it said, 
Um, however, if this is the case, then this is your problem. They never see it. So there's an accuracy problem, and then there is an intelligence gap. That has nothing to do with the smartness of the people doing it. Here's what happens. The level one SOC analysts are reading this document, and as soon as they see a sentence that convinces them they have a match, they go, that's my problem, they go fix it. Not realizing that if they read the five paragraphs after that, there's even more stuff to help them realize the problem's a lot deeper than they realized. So speed, accuracy, intelligence are the three fundamental measurable problems that we see AI potentially helping. So at IBM, we started four years ago teaching Watson, right? Just like Watson does cancer diagnosis better than most doctors now. And it does, you know, we have hundreds if not thousands of other vertically aligned projects of doing AI. We started teaching Watson four and a half years, well, four, just over four years ago, to ingest and digest threat intelligence. First thing we had to do is teach it the language of cyber. That's where we discovered that cyber has some terms that mean totally different things outside of the cyber bubble. My favorite one was hash. We had to teach Watson that hash is not food and an illegal drug. Uh, we really did, I'm not kidding. You know, we plug stuff in, it pops out a recipe. We're going, that's not what we meant. Um, but anyway, so we have taught Watson over the last four years to ingest and digest threat intelligence, and guess what happens as a result? That is an actual screenshot of Watson after four and a half seconds taking a bunch of indicators from some security analytics tooling and saying, base, uh, because by the way, today we have over a million sources of threat intelligence on a daily basis being ingested, digested inside of Watson. It's called Watson for Cybersecurity. Four and a half seconds, Watson says, I found, based on all the evidence you've given me, We've got four strains of malware through 12 IP addresses, 17 URLs, 17 files are infected. Four and a half seconds versus having human beings trying to search for this stuff. See the point? All right, so here's a huge point here. So let's go from tactical to strategic. One of the things about AI is that IBM, we actually universally call AI augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Because when you say artificial intelligence, some people get creeped out by it and they go, oh, the robots are coming to take your job, look out. And we've been doing cognitive longer than arguably most, if not all, and we haven't seen a single job disappear. What we've seen actually happen is that people can do their jobs, such as handling 7,426 new pages of stuff every day. Here's some great statistics for you. Um, basically, what that says is, most pe is that the majority of organizations are actually ignoring half of the stuff that is coming up in their tooling, right? Not good at all. So here's what I'm gonna do to close with you. We found, I'm gonna add to what Rick covered, because he got one of them, but I'm telling you, there's two more. There are two ways, there's three ways right now that we see the hackers attacking AI engines. The very first one is they're using AI for their attacks. You go out deep web, get a couple million emails, and then what you do is use an AI engine to suck in social media feeds and stuff like that, and then you use AI to guess their passwords. Number one. Number two is you mislead the AI engine. False negatives. Here's a good case. What if you have an AI engine that is tuned with a voice interface to only respond to two or three people's voices? And what you do is you speak to it, and let me take an extreme case. We have these things going on, you might want to shut down the nuclear reactor. What the hackers are doing is they're getting in between the spoken voice and when it hits the AI engine to introduce silent noise into the voice stream so the AI engine doesn't trigger. Just imagine sitting there screaming at your AI engine, figure this out and do the right path, but it can't understand you because it doesn't realize that it's being hacked. Massive implications of that. And then the final one, of course, is the one most people think of, which is per perversion of the model. Feed data into it slowly and surely to where it comes with poor outcomes. We spend an inordinate amount of time making sure, not only vetting the inputs, but vetting the outputs of our cognitive stuff to make sure that that kind of slow burn stuff is actually caught, all right? So that's what I wanted to share with you. We have made a huge investment. We've acquired 28 companies to build our business. Israel's been at the center of a lot of it, and Israel remains at the center of a lot of it. 
We've acquired four or five companies here. We've got a major research center in Beersheba, and uh, we believe that Israel is, in fact, one of the centers of cybersecurity in the universe, and we are proud to have a tight partnership and ongoing investment here in Israel. I thank you all for your time, and I look forward to talking again.